Hello, my name is Dr. Thomas P. M. Barnett and I'm Chief Analyst for the online consultancy Wikistrat. What I'm going to brief here today are the results of a recent crowdsourced simulation that Wikistrat ran looking at the subject of China hitting the Great Development Wall. First I'd like to explain a little bit about Wikistrat. We are simultaneously a global community of subject matter experts devoted to studying globalization. We now number in the hundreds, soon in the thousands, and we hail from all over the planet and from diverse backgrounds in terms of subject matter expertise. Second, we feed a constantly evolving scenario-driven model of globalization itself, which we call the GLOMOD. Every simulation we run for clients or for ourselves feeds that larger whole. Third, we are the world's first and only massively multiplayer online consultancy. We provide crowdsourced simulations, war games, planning exercises. We allow for real-time observation and interaction with our analysts for clients. And on that basis, we like to sell ourselves as a completely transparent and archived process, meaning you can find out exactly where any idea occurred and where it came from in terms of analysts and where it came from in terms of where in the simulation. In terms of this simulation, it was conducted in March of 2012 over several weeks. It involved junior level analysts along with several senior experts. We solicited three phases of inputs. First, we asked them to brainstorm scenarios of China's expected growth slowdown. Precursing scenarios leading up to the slowdown, in situ ones describing the slowdown itself, and downstream scenarios describing the aftermath or the results of that slowdown. We then asked them to put together master narratives linking together individual scenarios that they generated across an eight-stage scenario dynamics grid, which we'll explain in detail later in the brief. Finally, we asked them to come up with strategic options for relevant actors in response to all these different scenarios. In terms of the rationale for the simulation, by virtually all expert accounts, China is now hitting that flattening part of the S-curve. So it's had its rapid expansion and now it's starting to taper off. That means it moves from extensive growth, simply throwing more resources, labor, materiel, at the problem to intensive growth where they have to shift to more productivity and innovation based growth. Plus China's four plus decade long demographic dividend has basically ended. That creates a shrinking labor pool, rising wages across the board and essentially ends China's cheap labor advantage for good. China is already losing low-end manufacturing jobs to Southeast and South Asia, and they're going to have to accept this even as they try mightily to move jobs into their own interior. I'd like to describe now sort of an evolution of economies to give you a sense as to where we place China in terms of its uh, developmental trajectory. We could talk about the most freedom limited economies and the classic example is the centralized socialism of the Soviet Union. If you get out to kind of that limit there, you start to move into a bit more freedom, there you're typically talking about oligarchic or clan based capitalism where barons or robber barons or oligarchs or senior members of the uh, political elite really dominate the economic landscape and that's basically where Russia uh, is situated now after the last uh, 20 years of evolution post-Soviet. If you really want to break out a bit more, then you move into state-directed capitalism. More free enterprise, but with a heavy role for the state and still a lot of state-operated enterprises. That's basically where you could put a Japan and a South Korea 20, 30 years ago. Further moving out past that in extensive, intensive uh, frontier, then you're talking classic big firm capitalism of the sort America experienced in the 1950s, 1960s, really where the EU is found now, really where Japan and South Korea have migrated over the last 20, 30 years. And then if you want to talk about really out there on the innovation frontier, then you're talking about entrepreneurial capitalism in its purest form. It tends to be island economies, classic example, Israel. And we could talk about a Singapore state-directed 20, 30 years ago 
having moved in the same direction as in Israel over the last 20, 30 years. You can draw a line between big firm capitalism and entrepreneurial capitalism, and you hit what a lot of people describe as sort of the perfect hybrid. Uh, big go-to-market players dominating the landscape, surrounded by a sea of entrepreneurial small players. And that's basically the U.S. market, two classic examples, information technology uh, and the pharmaceutical industry. So you can give you a sense here of kind of how economies evolve over time and become more freedom dominated. Now let's look at China. China basically centralized socialism under Mao, under Deng, moves into state-directed capitalism. Now what do we hear out of China? Where does it want to go? What is it signaling? Now we're looking at a go global strategy so they want to move in the direction of big firm capitalism. We see the push for indigenous innovation, want to move more into the entrepreneurial capitalism, want to have domestic-led growth, really that sweet spot where the United States is found. And most importantly, we worry about their potential to slide back into oligarchic capitalism as expressed by the fact that so few of the elite dominate so much of the economy, what we call the princely economy. So let's give you now some larger arguments about why China is going to slow down rather inevitably. The first one we can describe as demographics. We referenced it earlier. China's economic miracle, not that unique. Uh, basically, they got rid of dependence as a percentage of working population. You go back looking at youth on the bottom, elders on the top. You can see right here, China, 1965, about 80% of the population not working. Most of them children, very few adults, elders. So what they did to achieve their economic miracle, basically get rid of children, the one child policy. And they reached the apogee of that demographic dividend, which is that downward slope, basically in 2010, where they got their dependent population down to about 40% of their total population. From that point on, China begins to add elders. Why this is important? China's demographic advantage ends now. And when we project ahead to 2050, we're looking at a country that's going to have more old people than the United States will have people, in excess of 400 million. What this creates inside of China is what is known as the 421 problem. Four grandparents, two parents, and one child to rue them all. Because that kid, that little emperor, is the social security network for a lot of people. Second, we could talk about decrepitude. Here's Beijing on a clear day. In London in 1870, they used to romanticize this and call it fog. In truth, it was always coal smog. And we're looking at similar pollutants in China. Bigger problem for China, 22% of the world's population, 7% of the world's water. Third big issue, dependencies, one we explore in the simulation. Right now, the United States, biggest importer of oil in the world, China coming up rapidly as number two. Well before 2030, which is the time frame we're projecting to in many of these instances, China will surpass the United States and become the biggest importer of oil in the world. Fourth issue, defensiveness. China recently came out with designs for its new carrier, 21st century very sexy carrier. At the same time, it came out with its new carrier killer missile, which is sort of like coming out with new uh, body armor for cops and coming out with uh, brand new, best in the world, uh, armor piercing bullets. But it gives you a sense of how defensive China's becoming. Finally, the last D, democracy. We've never seen a big economy get up in a per capita income sense above 10,000 without first basically going democratic. In China right now, $4,400 per capita GDP moving into that prime democratization zone and well before 2030 will be above that 10,000 mark. Actually, it would be about 20,000 by that point. So pretty hard according to historical standards to imagine China getting that wealthy without becoming democratic. But the big variable here is China's going to get old very fast.